This is a video about a game that has one of the best online experiences, despite being released in 2001. All thanks to open source software and an extremely dedicated fan base. A game that could have slowly died out with the release of three sequels across three consoles is now more relevant than ever. We're going to talk about the mods that saved Melee multiple times over and explain how one of the most dedicated communities managed to add meta-shaping features to a 20-year-old game using nothing except the bytecode in the game's ISO file. This is how indie hackers saved Super Smash Bros. Melee. Coming off the massive success of Super Smash Bros. for the Nintendo 64 in 1998, Nintendo wanted a sequel for their brand new console the GameCube. The developers of the original game only had 13 months to make a sequel. This is an incredibly short turnaround time for a game, especially one with as many characters and interactions as Smash. The story behind the creation of Super Smash Bros. Melee is an amazing story for another time, one that we will probably never know in full given the closed nature of Nintendo. How it worked extremely hard. The engineering department tripled in size from 5 to 15 and they managed to deliver an absolute masterpiece. Distribution was a little different in 2001, so they had very little room for corrections. Melee only ever received two patches, and some tweaks were also made for the PAL version. These updates included some balance changes and bug fixes. No new features. On the surface, Melee seems like a very family-friendly game, much like its predecessor. But Melee was different. It didn't take long for people to discover some pretty advanced tech that dramatically increased the speed of the game. The two most important techs are shuffling and wave dashing. Shuffle is an acronym that stands for short hop, fast fall, L cancel. Short hopping is done by releasing the jump button while your character is still in the jump's wind up animation. For fast characters like Fox, this can be as few as three frames. When you reach the top of your jump, you can input a downed command to fall faster than usual. And if you press the shield button, which is bound to L, within 7 frames of landing, your landing lag will be halved. Melee runs at 60 FPS, so some of these frame windows are pretty tight. Shuffling allows you to perform aerial attacks with very little downtime. Wave dashing is synonymous with melee. There are few mechanics that are as tightly associated with the game. It was initially believed to be a bug, but the developers later shared in forums that they were aware of it during development. Shielding while airborne usually performs a dodge with iframes, this is called air dodging, but if you short hop and then air dodge directly into the ground, you can dash along the ground while remaining actionable. These mechanics are the bread and butter of competitive melee. They make the game incredibly fast and very hard to master. You have to consistently nail a 48 millisecond window just to use one of the most common mechanics in the game. Melee was a hit amongst the competitive scene, and it wasn't long before local tournaments started popping up. As the years went on, the competitive scene continued to grow until the sequel, Super Smash Bros. Brawl released for the Wii in 2008. A sequel split the player base as some players decided to move to the newer, smoother, but much slower game. To be honest, competitive Melee wasn't very approachable, and not just because of the advanced tech. There are two versions of Melee, NTSC and PAL. NTSC was released in Japan and America for the 2001 holiday season. PAL was released three months later in the other major regions. Since PAL had extra time, it included some more balance changes that are not in the NTSC version. The most important of these is probably some nerfs to Fox, who is the fastest and winningest character in Melee. So people in different regions had completely different game versions. Not only that, but the competitive format was also different. Since Melee was meant to be a family friendly game, there wasn't a standard tournament format. The default game has items which completely break the balance of the game and lots of stages with frustrating RNG elements. The game doesn't even come with all stages and characters unlocked. It was in this landscape that a player named Achilles1515 released 20XX. 20XX is a mod pack that addressed all these issues and makes the game competition ready from the get go. It unlocks all characters and stages, highlights for fair stages, and sets up matches with consistent settings. 20XX also comes with some additional tools that enables debug mode for Melee, meaning that players can see hitbox debug information to help them understand the game better. Something else that has been instrumental to Melee's success released in 2008. The Dolphin emulator was open source. This is an emulator for GameCube and Wii that made Melee and mods like 20XX more accessible than ever. 
Most tournaments still use official Nintendo hardware because you don't want to bite the hand that starves you, but Dolphin is still instrumental in making Melee more welcoming to new players. The GameCube CPU is a 32-bit Gecko processor. This is a processor based on the PowerPC architecture. All assembly written for the GameCube games use the PowerPC instruction set. The GameCube development kit allows you to write C code that can be compiled to this same instruction set. The Gecko is a weak CPU by today's standards, coming in at a whopping 486 MHz. Modern hardware can emulate this CPU without any issues. The Dolphin emulator, named after the GameCube's development name, is an open source GameCube and Wii emulator. It can also emulate the Wii since the Wii uses the same CPU architecture as the GameCube. Dolphin has recreated the equivalent of the BIOS for the GameCube, so the ISO files can be emulated on any modern computer. Melee comes in a 3GB ISO file. This file contains all the assets for the game and also includes all the bytecode. These blocks of hexadecimal numbers each represent an instruction. Assembly is just a human readable version of these codes. When you assemble assembly you get this hexadecimal bytecode representation. This bytecode and the corresponding assembly is all that Achilles had to write mods for Melee. Each assembly line is an instruction with a command and some data. When the game starts, all the code is loaded into memory and the program counter is set to the first instruction. Then it will go through one instruction at a time, completing all the commands. Since each instruction is 4 bytes, the program counter increases by 4 bytes after every instruction. Some instructions, like branching, allow the program to update the program counter to a new location manually. A branch and link will save the previous memory location in a special register called the link register allowing the program to continue once it is finished. A sequence with the branch and link followed by a return to the original address is the equivalent of a function call. Registers are just blocks of memory that allow you to store values. They are used for almost everything when performing actions in assembly. A register can hold a raw number or a memory address, which is also just a number. For example, I can load a value directly into a register using the load immediate instruction. I can also use registers to perform some calculations. For example, I can load the value of 9 into register 1 and the value of 7 into register 2 and then use the add instruction to put the result of adding these two values into register 3. Using the instruction set provided by PowerPC is enough to write almost all software. Higher level languages compile to assembly anyway. For GameCube games, registers 2 to 13 are volatile registers that can be changed at any point in the program, and registers 14 to 31 are non-volatile registers that should remain consistent across function calls, or branch and links. This is all by convention. This CPU also has dedicated registers, like a link pointer, to keep track of branch and links. There are also dedicated registers for floating point arithmetics, although these are rarely used in Melee. The GameCube has a feature called Gecko Codes, named after the CPU. This was a tool that was initially built by Nintendo to allow for debugging. You can supply the game with specific codes that will be stored in a separate part of memory and be executed on every frame. Gecko Codes are the easiest way to modify GameCube games. All Gecko Codes start with one byte to identify them, followed by a target address, then some data. Since the first byte is used to identify the code, all codes will replace that byte with a sensible default. In hexadecimal representation, one byte will be two characters. For example, a common code is 04, which lets you overwrite 32 bits of data. 0445BF28FFFFFFFF will process the code and overwrite the first 04 with 80. The memory block starting with 80 is where a lot of common game data and functions are stored. This particular block of memory, at 0845BF28, stores the current game save. Setting it to Fs unlocks all stages and characters. In this case, this is overwriting the memory with data, but you can also overwrite instructions. Another common Gecko code is C2, which lets you insert a custom assembly block at a specific memory location. Whatever command is at the target location will be replaced by a branch and link which means you can execute whatever code you like at any location and then return to the normal flow of a program. There are a ton of other codes that let you manipulate the game's memory. Competitive Melee continued to grow in popularity, even when Smash 4 released in 2014. Nintendo doubled down on making the game slower and the famous Melee documentary caused a huge increase in popularity. The next Smash game wouldn't come out until 2018, 
when Nintendo released Super Smash Bros. Ultimate for the Switch. Ultimate was fast, much faster than Brawl and 4. It was finally the game that competitive fans were waiting for. It also had the benefit of online play via Switch Online, which is terrible but better than nothing. Although rewarding, the advanced mechanics in Melee are not approachable to new players, making Ultimate a no-brainer for beginners. Ultimate took a big chunk of the fighting game market from Melee, and still does to this day. But the same year that Ultimate came out, Melee hacking legend Uncle Punch released the 1.0 version of one of the most influential fighting game mods of all time, Uncle Punch's training mode. Uncle Punch is perhaps the biggest contributor to the Melee community. You would be hard pressed to find a significant project that he isn't involved in in some way. He understands the game's bite code better than anyone else to the point where he managed to add custom game modes including new UI to the game by manipulating the memory with assembly. Training mode allows you to train specific melee tech like shuffle and wave dash but also much more using a dedicated training environment. It also shows you frame data about your inputs so that you can perfect the muscle memory for each action. Smash Ultimate is still more approachable to new players but with Uncle Punch's training mode, Melee gave players who were looking for a more rewarding experience a way to master these mechanics and find a home in Melee. It's fair to say that the Melee meta and community would be very different without this mod. Gecko codes are an easy way to modify game behavior, but they are very limited in nature. You can only manipulate specific memory addresses that are available to you, and you don't really have a way to add assets either. A more permanent solution for creating mods is to write assembly, recompile it into bytecode, and then add it back into the original game's bytecode. Modding Melee is already hard. You need a good understanding of the game's memory just to edit values and set configurations. Adding brand new features not intended to be ever supported by the original team is something else entirely. Uncle Punch had to expand the game's logic to support more events, and inside those events he leveraged the GameCube system calls to draw new elements to the screen. Adding fully fledged new features is an order of magnitude harder than reskinning old ones. As part of his groundbreaking work, Uncle Punch developed a framework for modding Melee called MEX. It is a framework that allows for the expansion of content using C instead of assembly. To do this, he basically had to decompile the bits of a game that he wants to edit and expose them as an API. Uncle Punch has such a good understanding of the game's inner workings that he was able to write C APIs for most of the game's systems, at least all the ones you'd reasonably want to mod. This allowed Training Mod to grow in features, but also laid the groundwork for the most important Melee mod ever created. Around this time, a young hacker named Fizzy was tinkering with custom hardware for the GameCube. He was looking for a way to save game data from live games so that they could be replayed and analysed at a future date. He would do this by reading all inputs of the game out of the memory and outputting them to a custom format. He could then modify Dolphin to manually set the memory and give an exact replay of the game. This has huge implications for the game. It allows all games to be saved with lossless quality and allows complex analysis of frame data without having to guess what happened based on the visuals. Slippy was used to provide advanced statistics in some major tournaments. At this stage, most players were using Dolphin to practice leveraging mods like 20XX, Uncle Punch's training mode, and Slippy for replays. But melee tournaments are all still played in person using original hardware. That became kind of a problem around the start of 2020. COVID hit a lot of competitive games hard, but most of them had some kind of networking to fall back on. Melee was only playable in person. Since it came out in 2001, there was absolutely no way to do matchmaking online. The melee scene came to a complete stop, and all events were paused during lockdown. Months passed without any melee tournaments. The thing about a replay system though, is that if you record the game on one computer, and play that recording on another computer fast enough, it's exactly like online netplay. By June of 2020, Fizzy managed to get a working version of online play for melee using the Slippy format. A 19 year old game got online matchmaking. The release of Slippy saved Melee during COVID and completely changed the way the game is played now. Melee is Slippy now. They go hand in hand, but that was not always a given. To understand Slippy, we have to understand its original purpose, replays. There are two ways to save a replay. You can save the state of each frame, kind of like a video does, or you can save the initial state and then the actions for each frame and replay them. The second one is more efficient, but can cause larger desyncs. One small change can compound quickly. Slippy actually stores both. It will store the state before and after every frame, and all the character's inputs for that frame. 
Let's take a look at the format that Slippy uses to save replays. Slippy files use the .slp extension. They are stored using universal binary JSON, a format which aims to be a more efficient binary representation of JSON. It's not human readable, but it is easier to pass in code. This is a Slippy replay file. It's all in binary and optimized for playback, but Project Slippy has a library that passes Slippy files into a more user-friendly format. There are two components at the root of the file. Metadata is just some data about the replay so that Slippy can pass it correctly, and raw contains a list of events. There are 10 event types. The first one is always event payloads. We don't really care about this one since it just contains metadata about the upcoming payloads. Game start is the first actual event. It's basically just a dump of the initial game data, including mode, settings, characters, and stage. Everything that exists in the game's game info block in memory is dumped to this event, including some data that we don't even understand. This event occurs exactly once per stream. The last event will always be game end, and this one isn't very interesting. Every frame will have up to five event types. Pre-frame update, frame start, item update, which can occur up to 15 times per frame, post-frame update, and frame bookend. Pre-frame update occurs once per frame per character. This event and game start are the only two events required to construct a replay file. The others are used for statistics and to enhance networking. A couple interesting things to note here. Slippy is storing the position of a player and the current inputs. It is also storing the random seed for every player for every frame. This helps reduce oddities that come from randomness in Melee. Frame start is used to further sync up the RNG and helps prevent desyncs. Item updates includes data for up to 15 items per frame. This includes character created items like lasers, needles, and turnips. Frame bookend will be sent once per frame and it indicates that all the frame's data has been processed. There is also an event that allows the replay file to include gecko codes. These can be very large, so there is another message splitter event so that these can be split into smaller chunks. Slippy plays all these events back by manually updating the game's memory. This in itself is a pretty impressive feat, but it's not quite enough for online play. The final piece of the puzzle that allowed Slippy to save the Melee community is the rollback netcode. Slippy's online play is always done peer-to-peer. -peer. There is no central authority that can determine the state of the game. Rollback netcode is a simple concept that performs very well for online fighting games. As previously mentioned, each frame will store the current state and the player's actions. The Slippy engine will predict the next frame using the player's current actions. If the player's actions change and the final state ends up being different, it will roll back once the correct data is received. It is very common for a player to have the same or very similar inputs across multiple frames, so the prediction engine allows the game to feel much faster. This is great for fighting games. The disadvantage is that rolling back comes with its own set of problems. An example of this is sound. Managing how sound effects are played is not trivial since a rollback could cause overlapping or repeated sound effects. This is especially challenging in Melee, and Fizzy had to find all the places in memory where sound data was stored and exclude them from the rollback process. Slippy is the result of much dedication, but there are also a few lucky miracles that made it a possibility. The ability to predict future frames is thanks to an uncommon mode in the base game called Lightning Melee. In Lightning Melee, the game engine will calculate multiple frames every frame. This causes the game to be very fast, but it also means that the original team had to separate the rendering and game logic so that they could be run independently. Without this feature, it would have been much harder for Slippy to predict the next frame states using the player inputs and then roll back all in the same frame. Another happy accident is the input lag that exists on original hardware. If you've ever seen a Melee tournament, you may have noticed that they still use massive CRTs. This isn't due to some misplaced nostalgia. CRTs are still used today because of the input lag that comes with LCD TVs. Input lag is pretty important in Melee, and players try to minimize it as much as possible. The only problem is that the GameCube itself has a ton of input lag, usually around 3 to 5 frames to be precise. Running the game at 60 FPS, that's about 64 milliseconds of delay. There are four systems at play when reading input from the console. The controller, which generates the input. The hardware buffer, which pulls the controller for input. The software buffer, which pulls the hardware buffer. And the game engine, which will update the game information. The game runs at 60 FPS, but the hardware buffer pulls at 120 Hz. The software buffer pole and hardware buffer pole are not synced. 
After you have pressed a button, you need the following things to happen in order. The hardware buffer pole, then the software buffer pole, then the game engine to run a frame. In the worst case scenario, the software buffer pole happens just after the game engine calculates a frame. Then you press the button right after the software pole. The next frame will be calculated without your input, then the software pole runs again and your input is loaded into memory. But you have to wait one more frame before your input is reflected in the game engine. In this case, you will have two full frames of additional input lag. Since your input was right after a frame and you missed one frame in the middle. On average, this will be closer to 1 and a bit frames. This is additional input lag on top of the normal display one. So normal melee, as God intended, can have up to 5 frames of input lag. What does this mean for Slip Evo? Well, 2 frames of input lag at 60 frames per second is about 32 milliseconds of delay. Fizzy forked the Dolphin emulator and removed the additional delay that comes from the unsynchronized polling. If your ping is less than 32 milliseconds, your online melee experience using Slippy will be equivalent or better than playing in person. I cannot understate how big of a deal this is. Not many games can boast that they have the same amount of lag at a LAN as they do online. Thanks to Slippy, the online experience for melee is actually much better than even Smash Ultimate. Slippy has more stable connections with better netcodes, skill-based matchmaking and ranked with lower input lag and no monthly memberships. Slippy means that Melee has one of the best online experiences of any fighting game period. It's amazing what a young hacker accomplished with some assembly and dolphin modifications. Melee survived the release of three sequels, one for each console Nintendo made after the GameCube, and continues to thrive and grow today. In the past year, two characters that have been considered trash for 20 years have won major tournaments against the best players in the world. All thanks to advancements brought forward by Slippy's online play and Uncle Punch's training mode. These indie hackers reshaped a 20 year old masterpiece and made it accessible for generations to come. There has never been a better time to play the best fighting game ever created. Whether you're a gamer or a hacker, now is a great time to dive into Melee. I'll leave links to support Uncle Punch and Project Slippy in the description. If you love Melee, consider donating to these legends that have kept the game alive and healthy. Thanks for watching.